Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the progressive gait deterioration in Dravet syndrome. And this has been observed by lots of investigators, including Dr. Dravet and, and the uh, Japanese and other French and Italian groups. And we uh, decided to look in this in more detail because of Bill, who you see here and I mentioned yesterday. And uh, this work was really led by uh, Dr. Jill Rodder, who is a postdoctoral physiotherapist and Professor Kerr Graham, a, post, uh, a professor of orthopaedic surgery, paediatric orthopaedic surgery. And they do a lot of work in cerebral palsy and trying to improve gait for children with cerebral palsy. So, um, as I said before, oh well, now this really is our adult study is where this work started and we had 14 adult patients, as you can see, aged 18 to 47 years. This is some time ago now, 2006. Um, and when we looked at the 14, nine had neurological ex uh, abnormalities on examination with ataxia only in four, intention tremor. Uh, they had spasticity, which is pr what pyramidal signs mean in five, but they also had extra pyramidal features, so like Parkinsonian type features in four. Um, they showed gait deterioration and although, and I think Dr. Drave showed this beautifully yesterday when she showed the ataxia of the younger child with the wide-based gait. But when you look at these uh, videos I'm going to show you, you'll see that the adults actually don't have such a wide-based gait. They have a narrow gait and it's not the typical ataxia from the cerebellum that neurologists think about. The other important point is that the deterioration in gait is completely out of synchrony with the other features of Dravet syndrome. So in the first five years of life, the child has terrible seizures, uh, and, and the sort of two to six-year-old age group, their uh, learning difficulties, intellectual concerns emerge, but this gait decline is later. And probably around from about the age of nine. Now, that's what we originally showed. My observation subsequently is that I'm seeing it in more of my three and four-year-olds than I realized before. And like everything in medicine, once you get your eye into something, you see it more in Dr. Dravet's nodding there, I think. So I mentioned Bill yesterday, and um, Bill is who I just mentioned we gave the salivary medicine to yesterday, and it made a big difference. And, and this is where it started, really looking at Bill's gait, which isn't that wide-based, um, and is amazing, actually, when you watch him turn around there, um, that he's actually relatively um, stab stable, given his uh, quite abnormal gait, a little bit unsteady and he's uh, coming towards us. And then Bill's mum at the time kindly provided me with these um, pictures showing what he can do outside. Look, he can ride a trike, he wouldn't have thought that possible. Uh, and if you look at the other two, he can actually have a go at what we call totem tennis, don't know if that translates to here. And um, the, bottom, the bottom one's actually the best because you see him, despite this very abnormal gait, he can negotiate this. And look, he can even jump and not fall. It's pretty amazing with that gait. So um, with this study, we thought that we might find a characteristic pattern with onset around puberty of children and adolescents, adults with Dravet syndrome. And we did a prospective cross-sectional gait study in patients with Dravet syndrome. And really, Jill Rodder did all the work here. And so the clinical history she took, um, she did a standardized physical examination tailored to gait. Uh, we did some imaging, some x-rays, the uh, special functional study. And I think I might have skipped too fast there. Um, there's also the gait analysis, which is uh, in the gait lab and this functional mobility scale. Now this is a scale they use a lot in their cerebral palsy studies, and they use this to scale the impact of the gait problem on a child or adult uh, in terms of daily functions. So does their gait, can they still do whatever they want at five metres walking, 50 metres walking, or 500 metres walking? And when does it impact? And you can see there the scores. Are they able to run, walk, or do they need a wheelchair? So here you'll see, uh, oh, just a second, we'll go back. The gentleman at the back's gonna help me. Um, so here you see a little one with uh, within normal limits, her gait. Uh, and this is how we classify gait. 
And we'll do the middle one second. You can see there that little uh, boy of about five or six has a variable gait pattern. And then uh, you see this description here of a crouch gait, which is what I'm going to focus on. And so uh, this came from our work, and Dr. Drave uh, kindly showed this yesterday. And you can see here this crouch gait stance, where uh, the child or, or adolescent really has increased hip flexion, uh, increased knee flexion, and the ankle dorsiflexion, which means uh, the foot going uh, with a funny angle at the uh, ankle. So in this study, we had 26 patients with a mean age of 12 years, but you can see importantly from 2 to 34 years of age, 23 of our 26 had SCM1A mutations. I haven't checked if that's changed. Uh, as Dr. Paduri said before, we're finding mutations that have been missed with the new technology. So in fact, our numbers are slowly but surely climbing up. And in my hands, Dravet syndrome has a 90% SCM1A mutation now as they find more and more mutations. Now this table is interesting. You can see on the right hand side that the uh, mean age of walking is 16 to 18 months. We looked according to the age of the children at the time of study and it's exactly the same. So really they walk a little bit late. The top age of normal walking or typical walking is 16 months and you can see they're 16 to 18 months. Um, I think almost all of them walked by two years but not quite all. So this is what they found, emerging crouch gait. So you see a normal uh, little four-year-old. Then you see Molly here, actually, and she's about eight, eight years old there. And then you see Bill there. And so the six to 12-year-olds have a mild crouch, and then the adults have this very prominent crouch with which uh, you can see Bill can still run. In the coronal views, you can see normal uh, under five years of age and then uh, the mild crouch, and then you see um, a young lady of about 18 years with a much more severe crouch. And this was the overall pattern, and you can see uh, that there was a significant deterioration with age. So at zero to five years, you see normal or mild crouch, but as I mentioned, I'm noticing it a little bit more in my three to four year olds now. Um, in the six to 12 years of group, you can see uh, in the green that 50% have a moderate crouch. And over 13 years of age, the majority had crouch. And I think the only one that didn't was Danielle, who I mentioned yesterday as my um, twin of normal intellect. So here you can see the very prominent uh, crouch stance with the hip flexion um, and the knee flexion. And uh, you can see the data on the left side show a significant uh, decrease in hip extension, so the ability to extend your leg backwards uh, in the uh, patients over 13 years of age. The knee flexion uh, becomes significantly different in the 6 to 12 year age group and you can see that it's much more marked in the adolescent age group. They also have uh, abnormalities of internal rotation of their hip which are present throughout. Uh, which means, if you like, that their femur, their leg, the, uh, the thigh bone is turned inwards. Uh, and then they also have external rotation of their shin. Um, and you see those little arrows. Basically, their um, shin bone if, um, is turned outwards and doesn't come back to normal, which is why they have the funny stance. So this shows this nicely, the bony malalignment in the transverse plane. So the femur is turned inwards with that little arrow uh, around. The, fib uh, the lateral fibial torsion and the tibia are this way. And then you have very flat feet, which I'm sure you've seen in lots of your children, called planar abducto valgus. Uh, and there you see it again, uh, the foot posture there with this plano abducto valgus um, and it becomes very significant with moderate to severe changes in those over 13 years of age. The radiology showed mild hip dysplasia throughout uh, all age groups, but the foot deformity became more apparent with age. 
Um, and you can see that uh, it's much more marked with that green bar at the bottom in the adolescence. So what about the, the ability uh, consequences for daily function? Um, and here you see the functional mobility scale um, and it shows a change over time. Uh, with the zero to five year old age group in purple, you can see they can walk and run with only one in a wheelchair. The six to 12 year old age group, the wheelchair use is increasing and the um, adults, the wheelchair um, use in the one is just one, but there are quite a few that need assistance with the green bar. And this is for the 500, uh, 500 metre status on the functional mobility scale. So in terms of the five and 50 metres, most of the patients rate a six or a five, which means they can walk or run around, and we've seen that here at the conference, which is great. But when you talk about the community status, that's the 500 metres, um, the impairment goes up, uh, in the, particularly in the adolescent and adult age group. So what does this mean uh, for us all? Well, the first is we need to recognise the gait deterioration and, um, you know, um, make sure families are aware of it and think about what we can do, um, and neurologists need to know about it. I involve physiotherapists to help with advice, but Dr Rodder is very emphatic that gait analysis is not necessary, that whilst it was useful for us to... Um, uh, characterise the abnormality, it's not really going to help us at the moment. And I think the question about orthopaedic surgery with multi-level orthopaedic in, um, surgery where they may uh, cut, chop lots of the bones at different levels to try and um, straighten gait up, whilst it's very successful in the cerebral pop, uh, palsy population, and these, these people are experts in that, they're much more reticent in our Dravé patients. And I think it's because partly cognition that they don't have the intellect necessary for the rehabilitation to be sure you, you always risk that they'll go off their feet and won't walk again so that's a, a very scary possibility um, and also because of the slowly progressive flavor of this um, I think that's also worrying them and with my adults like Bill I think you know he's pretty stable. He might be getting slightly more bent, but not too not too worse over not, not too much worse over the last ten years. So, um, what else can you do? You can support the feet um, with orthoses, the orthoses and ankle boots like these. Um, and it's recommended that you try and get your child to uh, have activities and games where they reach up, they stretch. You get them to look upwards for things, uh, playgrounds, and in the park. Uh, equipment that can help them to do this more and different surfaces to keep, keep their skills. Reaching games are really important. Uh, placing things up high in cupboards and on shelves. These are just practical. I can't promise you they'll help but that's certainly what Dr Rod has advocated. So the last little point I wanted to make between you and lunch is um, this study from Dr Andrade's group in uh, Toronto. And this is just really a preliminary study, but is interesting. And it looks at 12 adults with Dravé, and she describes them as severe bradykinesia, uh, which means slow movements. And I think you could see that with Bill, although he still could run, which is amazing. And um, they didn't include uh, Dravet patients if they were on antipsychotics, because that could affect your gait. 11 had severe intellectual disability, which is pretty um, what you might expect. And mild spasticity is seen, it was seen in 12% of patients. And I think that certainly comes along when you look after Dravet children for many years, you don't examine them, but if you examine them after puberty hits, you will see this mild spasticity, which is quite common. Um, and she describes them as having mild Parkinsonism with asymmetric rigidity and cogwheel phenomenon, which is this sort of um, sort of jerky tremor that you feel when it's not tremor when you actually move the limb. Um, and here are the patients, and she describes eight having anticollis, which is this this basically the head on the trunk that the. Now I don't think any of my adult patients are like that, so it's interesting because it's quite different in terms of the head. They mostly do have the bent posture, the, the kyphosis, but it's 
It's maybe slightly different, more of the crouch that you've seen. Um, they looked at these with um, peripheral uh, EMG studies and found no evidence of myopathy, but continuous activation of the neck muscles, and they thought it was a dystonic co-contraction, so the muscles sort of acting inappropriately together. In this study, um, they um, then put two of the severe patients only on 300 milligrams of levodopa per day, which is a treatment for Parkinson's disease, for 16 weeks. So it's only a study of two patients, and we need this to be done with larger numbers in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to look at it further. But it's interesting to think that levodopa could improve the slowness and rigidity, and one was no longer wheel-bound, wheelchair-bound uh, for long distances. So I, ha I think there are some Parkinsonian or extrapyramidal features. I'm not sure um, that ours look just like these patients, but I certainly think the idea of trying levodopa is, is interesting and one I'd like to pursue. So in summary, uh, the crouch gait appears most obviously um, after about 13 years of age, but I think maybe they're subtly earlier. Uh, there is this peak picture of bony malalignment where the bones don't continue to form the way ours normally do through life. And there's increased medial femoral torsion, lateral tibial torsion, that's the leg part, and there's pes valgus of the foot. And um, Dr. Rodder found that there were, was weakness in the anti-gravity muscles, which with the pubertal growth spurt, that weakness and the bony malalignment result together in the crouch gait, which produces significant functional impairment. Um, and that functional impairment, as you see, is the 500 metres. And you can see here a number of the older uh, children and young adults are using wheelchairs to get around the longer distances. Importantly, this is not entirely restricted to Dravet syndrome, and the more you see it, the more you see this crouch gait in lennox gasto syndrome and other patients. Um, but I wonder if the SCM1A for Dravet, the mutation actually does have some direct effects, though we don't understand that. We know that there are nice mouse studies, and the mouse uh, of the Catterall lab has been referred to many times already in the meeting, and they showed that these mouse, mice were ataxic. Uh, with abnormalities in the cerebellum. I'm not sure if it's explaining this, and I'd love them to look at old mice and see if they had a change in their gait. And um, I've shared with you some strategies to try and prevent this deterioration, but whether we really can, I don't know. And just the final picture from the Australian group, and you can see I'm a lot younger there, 2004. Um, and um, just to show you, these are Molly's mum and her grandmother, and. Um, also Bill's mum's here, so some of these families have really been with us for the long haul and um, the Australian families have just been superb in helping us with our research. So thank you once again for having me here.